Good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's class. Let's uh, pray and get started. Uh, could one of us go ahead and lead in prayer, and then we will uh, pick up from where we had stopped in the last class. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for this time. Lord, we come before your presence this morning. We ask, oh God, that you would speak to us, uh, help us to know your word. Uh, we submit this entire session into your hands and ask, oh God, that you would minister. Um, help all of us to um, uh, pay attention and to understand from your word, God. Help us, Nancy, to share your word, God. We praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Uh, let's get back to where we were earlier. We were talking about the third missionary journey and how uh, Paul was coming to the end of that missionary journey, how he returned to Jerusalem despite the many warnings that he received that chains await him once he reaches Jerusalem. He comes up to Jerusalem and over there the elders of the church uh, tell him that he now has an image among the Jews that uh, he an upholder of the traditions uh, of Judaism. Uh, and so, you know, uh, though he's a Christian, uh, he did not do anything which uh, let down the Jews. And so he wanted to make this right. And so the elders gave him uh, an idea to go to the temple and, uh, you know, pay his respects to uh, give some offerings or a purification. There was a particular custom of purification to engage in that. And there were uh, some men whom, he, whom they sent along with Paul. So we talked about how he went to the temple uh, in order to complete this um, uh, obligation and uh, while he was at the temple uh, he was misunderstood because uh, some of the jews they noticed that he had an acquaintance who was from ephesus and so they assumed that he was bringing uh, an asian into the temple or a non-jew into the temple which caused them to be offended about Paul and we saw how the whole uproar began and in the context of the Roman uh, Empire it was uh, not good for any state or region to uh, be out of order because then the main authorities would come and they would kind of take over and so to avoid that situation you have a commander who steps in who comes to seize Paul and take him into the barracks but in the meantime you know, Paul wants to explain himself and uh, because he is able to speak in the Hebrew language, uh, he was accepted by the onlookers and the listeners. He goes ahead and he narrates. He starts to talk about himself. And uh, at one point where he makes a comment uh, about the Gentiles, the whole crowd is upset because you know they had that rivalry between uh, themselves and the gentiles and so at that point uh, paul has to be taken away by the commander and we saw how once he was taken by the commander he uh, explains that he is a roman citizen that's where where we were and uh, it was pretty hard those days to get the citizenship of Rome. Uh, and, and the commander was amazed that uh, this individual could be uh, a Roman citizen because uh, in the times that Paul lived in, either you could be born as a Roman citizen or you would have to pay a hefty amount in order to purchase your citizenship. And uh, so when you know Paul said that, uh, how can you treat uh, me like this? I am uh, a Roman citizen he we stopped uh, somewhere around verse 25 of chapter 22 where uh, paul said uh, to the centurion who stood by is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a roman and uncondemned so for a roman they had to follow the procedures uh, which they were not actually doing at that time so the commander uh, asks him he says okay uh, he, he doesn't ask him, but he kind of tells the others around him uh, because he's the centurion and the soldiers under him are the ones who are keeping Paul. He says, take care what you do for this man is Roman. Again, this particular uh, situation could become worse because they had uh, they are beginning to understand that they are probably mistreating a Roman citizen. 
So uh, the commander himself seems like he was not from uh, uh, Rome and he had purchased his own citizenship. So in verse 28, he says, uh, with a large sum, I obtained this citizenship. But Paul clarifies, he says, I was born a citizen. So this is the point where uh, we had kind of stopped. And the next day, we see that uh, Paul is brought before the Sanhedrin and uh, uh, there uh, there is a lot of uh, confusion among the people of the sanhedrin in order to uh, to kind of take a call on paul and uh, let's see how this whole interrogation proceeds and uh, from the sanhedrin and the authorities where do they actually uh, take paul so now we have to uh, understand or review how the Sanhedrin is going to deal with this man, Paul. So that's where we are at, uh, the beginning of chapter 23. From here, we'll see that Paul will go under the hands of uh, uh, several Gentile uh, commanders or people in authority. We would see that you know after this council, uh, he will be transported to another place where uh, they would say that let him undergo the trial over there. and. There will be the Gentile authorities who will um, question Paul. So we will initially see one particular person handle Paul's case. He delays the case uh, in expectation of a bribe, and uh, after which another person comes in, uh, and uh, you know Paul has to redo his explanation all over again. Uh, but even that person does not really give him a, a, a fair hearing. And at that time, you would see the visit of uh, uh, Herod. Herod would come by as well. So when Paul is under trial, he will be under rulers and uh, under kings. And eventually, you don't really see any conclusion to Paul's matter. Uh, and uh, this point that he's a Roman citizen, he makes use of that particular uh, uh, advantage that particular uh, status of his uh, for his own advantage. And what he does is he asks to himself go to Rome. So towards the end of uh, the book of Acts, we will find that uh, Paul will actually travel to Rome and uh, he would want to make a defense for himself. So that is how things are going to proceed from here. So I'm just giving you in a gist what you can expect in the upcoming chapters. So um, we will read on some portions are uh, worth uh, stopping at and uh, explaining further. But then uh, the, the narration of what is going to take place, that we can go over very quickly. And I've given you a summary already, so you know where this is headed. So right now, Paul is before the council. And uh, seems like uh, there's no one to speak for Paul. He has to speak for himself. But uh, it's really nice, to again, to look at the life of Paul and see the kind of um, integrity that he lived in, that he very boldly could uh, defend his himself. He very boldly could speak for himself. There was no lawyer on his behalf or no uh, leader on his behalf. Uh, and yet, you know, Paul strongly uh, could argue even with the authorities. So the beginning of chapter 23, where uh, we notice that uh, uh, he's standing before the council uh, and he speaks to them. And he says, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So we can just stop right there and uh, think about Paul's life and his position before God. Now, what does it take for someone to say that I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day? So... That's really great. If one of us could stand up and say that towards the end of our lives, uh, that would mean that we've we've been able to fulfill God's purpose uh, in God's way. And uh, we've been able to glorify God in all that we have done. So that is Paul's testimony. He's standing before the authorities and he's saying, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And that's such a bold statement uh, while he's going under trial. So uh, as this comment comes from Paul, uh, we may expect 
the authorities to appreciate him. But you know, there is someone by the name of uh, Ananias. Now, don't get confused. There is more than one Ananias, more than one James, right? So you would you would notice similar names, uh, more than one Simon. So we need to be careful about who we are talking about. So this Ananias is the high priest, and uh, the high priest was so offended. Now, we can see uh, that though he's the high priest, he's, he's really not displaying any sense of humility. The moment he hears this from Paul, uh, he asks, you know, uh, he, or rather he commands somebody who's standing next to Paul to strike him on the mouth. So, you know, such a rude gesture or such a gesture to display the kind of authority that the high priest had. Uh, so, you know, that itself shows how he took Paul's comment. He, he uh, despised it. He rejected it. And, uh, you know, he looked down on Paul for making a comment like that. Maybe the high priest thought, you know, how dare you? You are uh, uh, soon to be convicted. And uh, how could you stand before the authorities, the council, and say that you, you are innocent? while we are still here interrogating you. So the high priest never liked it. He asked the person who's standing next to him to strike Paul on the mouth. So, you know, Paul is going through a lot of persecution, isn't it? Uh, he's been seized. He uh, was uh, taken to the barracks. Uh, he is now brought before the council. And can you imagine uh, when he is still not condemned, that's exactly what he said in the previous chapter. I'm a Roman citizen. I'm uncondemned. How can you treat me like this? Yes, they are, you know, slapping him or striking him on the face. Uh, I don't know if he thought of the times that Jesus went through such humiliation and persecution. So that's where Paul is standing. And, uh, you know, Paul uh, also got angry because of this gesture. And he kind of uh, gets back at uh, uh, the, the, uh, the council member here. He says, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law. And do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? So he just gets upset that those who are supposed to uphold the law are doing their own thing. And justice is nowhere to be seen. So when he makes this statement, um, the people around him remind him that he's actually talking to the high priest. And uh, Paul's response, you know, this is the same Paul who said, pray for those who are in authority, uh, you know, honor those who are in authority. So uh, he immediately repents. In verse 5, uh, he says, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So Paul immediately repents of what he had done. And uh, after which, you know, God gives him the wisdom to um, uh, actually sort of uh, deal with this very uh, scary circumstance. He's before the council. Anything can happen to him right now. But he realizes that there were some Sadducees and other Pharisees uh, in the in the uh, audience and so what he does is he cries out to the council and uh, he says men and brethren i am a pharisee the son of a pharisee concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead i am being judged so when he makes this statement what do you expect when there are sadducees and pharisees anyone what can we expect It's a very smart move. That much I'll tell you. Read through his statement carefully. We are in verse 6 of chapter 23. Okay, what did the Sadducees? Yeah, yes, please. 
Yeah, so uh, in verse six, hmm, Paul just says it's the Pharisees and the Sadducees yeah. who were against him. So to make a connection, he just says, I am a Pharisee and I'm the son of a Pharisee. So uh, that's what I feel like it's happening over here. Okay, but how is, how is it going to help him? Okay, what did the Sadducees believe, anyone? They don't believe in resurrection. Exactly. They don't believe in resurrection. Okay. And uh, Paul is here noticing that the audience has both of these, um, uh, you know, uh, people with both of these beliefs. One set that doesn't believe in resurrection. The other, the Pharisees, who believe in resurrection. Right. Now, he's standing before them. And he is um, he is uh, projecting, or he is sort of uh, making this identity of his as a Pharisee uh, very real. So then it becomes it, there's a question there for the Pharisees: you know, Will you protect this man who believes what you believe? Okay, uh, and there is a question for the Sadducees, which is. Um, he doesn't, he believes in resurrection and therefore he has to be condemned, you know, uh, what stops us from condemning him? So the Sadducees would like to condemn him. Pharisees would now be like defending him. So within the council, there are dissensions, disagreements, according, because of this matter of resurrection, which works as an advantage for Paul. So, as soon as he says this thing about uh, resurrection, you no, know, like, come on, what did I do? I was only preaching concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, and you know, I'm being judged for that. And immediately, within the council, they started arguing, and uh, you know, they they were uh, 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 like, it, now it becomes a question of who's right, who's wrong. And the Pharisees began to uh, protest and say, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has uh, spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So he kind of gets the sympathy of the Pharisees, uh, while at the same time, you know, the Sadducees are now opposing the Pharisees. So uh, when the council is in such a state where you have the authorities fighting, how would you ever reach a conclusion? So then they decide, OK, it's best now for us to uh, get this prisoner out of sight because any harm could take place. Let's put him back in the prison and let's deal with the situation later. So he escaped that particular session uh, by bringing up this, this matter about resurrection. Now, what else? Once he escaped, you will find that there are many dangers against his life. Uh, and, you know, it's really God's grace that uh, protects him each time. So he's in the prison. Uh, but there is another set of people who are waiting to kill Paul. And uh, they are so very, um, you know, passionate about this that, you know, they, they are fasting in order to kill Paul. And uh, that's how how uh, strongly they want him dead okay so let's just read about this group of people uh, we have a description about them from verse 11 to verse 22 and it's self-explanatory so if someone can read that we we would uh, see what exactly is going on outside of the council Verse 11, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Should I continue now? And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves 
underwent oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you therefore go with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So when Paul's sister's son, Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, Tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. Verse 23, And he called for two centurions, saying, Prepare two hundred soldiers, seventy horse, horsemen, and two hundred spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. He wrote a letter in the following manner. Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor, Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was bought and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was ac ac accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him, deserving to death, deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. The next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and returned to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. Thank you, Rosalind. You read a very long passage, actually. Um, and uh, we could see how Things were unfolding in Paul's life. It's quite self-explanatory, as we have seen. So there was this uh, a set of people who were willing to fast until Paul was killed. And this plot was identified by um, uh, Paul's sister's son. And he brought this news to Paul. And Paul sent him to the, uh, to the commander and, uh, you know, uh, once the commander took notice of this, he also realized there's a threat to Paul's life. And uh, we must recall that the reason why they are so scared about uh, being 
uh, you know, like if anything happens to Paul, he's a Roman citizen and they would get into trouble. And so that is why they could, they had to do everything in their capacity to protect this man till he is actually condemned. So the Roman, uh, so the commander realizes that uh, he has to protect Paul and in these circumstances, we saw the plot. The plot was something like uh, uh, Paul, Paul, when he would go to the council, they would kill him. So that was the plan. So the commander very wisely decides that it is best for Paul to go to a higher authority, a governor by the name of Felix, uh, who uh, is in Caesarea. So he tries to transport Paul uh, to this particular place. We see how he does it. He does it, does it very uh, safely. So late in the night uh, with many foot soldiers, he he kind of you know picks a particular route so that Paul is safe and he sends him to Felix. And we saw the letter also that he has written. So Claudius uh, Lysias, which is himself, right? He says, uh, I'm writing to you most excellent Felix, uh, greetings. And then he goes about explaining uh, regarding Paul. So how does he define Paul? He just says, we found him, we seized him uh, from the Jews because uh, they were going to kill him. Please note that he's also a Roman citizen. And uh, uh, so far, there have been some matters regarding the law for which he is accused. But, uh, you know, there is nothing that we found which uh, says that he deserves death. Now, it is best that you interrogate this matter. And so he hands over Paul to Felix. And we notice here that when uh, Paul comes to this place, uh, Felix says, okay, I will look into this issue, but let your accusers also, your accusers also come. So that is where we are going to stop. Let's move on to chapter 24. So now the accusers have to come and make their claims. Uh, Felix will listen to the accusers and uh, if Paul has something to say, he would also listen to Paul and come to the conclusion of uh, what it is that this man has done, uh, that, 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 that there is such an uproar against him. So we are at uh, chapter 24 here, where uh, Felix has to give a fair hearing. Now, who is the person who would uh, uh, you know, want to speak against Paul? We find that Ananias, the high priest, the person who got offended in the Sanhedrin, in the council, he comes to uh, Caesarea to accuse Paul. So he comes down with his elders and also uh, looks like those days they had uh, a speaker with them. A speaker in today's context, it's something like a lawyer, someone who will, who will speak, who will argue the case. So there was a speaker here uh, in the text. It says uh, an orator by the name of Tertullus. So they all came in order to present the case against Paul, that he was not for the Jews, that he was for the Gentiles, and you know all, all kinds of other accusations that they wanted to bring against him. So they come, and uh, this particular person, Tertullus, the, the speaker, begins to speak. So he does his uh, oratory. You know how they usually uh, do it. They'll uh, start with a lot of uh, flattery of the, the person in authority. So that's how the orator speaks here. Seeing that uh, I'm at verse 2 of chapter 24, where he says, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. So you, you notice like there's a lot of flowery language and flattery before they can actually get into the matter. So verse 3, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix with all thankfulness. Okay, now he slowly comes down to the actual uh, matter over here. So let's see what, what he states about Paul. So verse 4, nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension, 
among all the Jews throughout the world and the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. So, as you can notice, the orator in his you know complicated language, uh, he kind of uh, puts across a praise followed by a list of accusations. What are these accusations? You know, he says, this man is a troublemaker. Okay, he is a um, um, creator of dissension or a lot of confusion among the Jews throughout the world. So you see how there is exaggeration as part of uh, what is being spoken. Because what is the reason that they uh, accused him with in Jerusalem when he was caught? That he brought a Gentile, isn't it? He brought a Gentile into the temple and he defiled the temple. That was the single accusation based on which people started quarreling and everything happened. But now, somehow, accusations have piled up. So it's more than him bringing a Gentile into the temple. They are stating all kinds of things that he's a troublemaker, he has created a lot of uh, quarrels among the Jews, then uh, you know he profaned the temple and uh, you know we we were ready we were ready to actually judge him but it's because of this this commander lysias he violently brought him uh, you know to you now you please listen to whatever we have to say and uh, pass a judgment on this man paul so what would be fair on felix's part at this point to Felix, he's a Gentile authority. Um, he needs to listen to both sides. So he has heard, you know, Ananias, the high priest, his side of the story. Because it's as if the Jews are so offended now. Uh, and uh, Paul is that primary reason. Now, Felix, ha Felix has to give a conclusion to this matter. Now, Felix has to listen to Paul, right? So. He gives him a chance. Then Paul, from verse 10, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered. So now Felix is looking at Paul, saying, OK, what is your defense? These are the matters that uh, they are accusing you with. So then now Paul starts to speak. Notice he has nobody to speak for him. <laughs> but one good thing is he's a scholarly man. I'm sure he would understand the context and give a good defense for himself you know, regarding the points of accusation. So Paul speaks. He says, uh, in as much as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they, they now accuse me. But this I confess to you. So basically, he discarded their claims of uh, them calling him a troublemaker. But he's saying, but one thing I do confess of, what is that one thing from verse 14? I confess to you that according to the way, remember that talk, the way is Christians. According to the way, which they call a sect. So I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. So he is talking about his faith in God. He's talking about 
um, you know, somewhere he's saying that there are, it's not like I've gone away from them creating trouble. It's not like that. This, the, we believe in, this, in the same God, right? Like uh, the God of the Jews is the God that I believe in. And then he goes on to explain, uh, you know, regarding resurrection and all of that. But he definitely states the way, which means that he has moved on from Judaism to believing in Jesus Christ. And he's now a part of, he is a believer in Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, apart from the faith of his, he also states regarding his way of life where he justifies and says that he lives a life of integrity, uh, a life which is right before God. So actually three things. He says that he has nothing to do with their accusations uh, about him being a troublemaker. Secondly, he confesses that, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in um, resurrection of, of the dead. And uh, he also says that my life, yeah, I'm living according to this newfound faith, which I have. So that is his defense to what was stated against him. Um, yeah, and then he goes on to describe how he came up to the temple and, uh, you know, he was just paying his, his honors while they created this whole confusion and uh, the, the uproar happened and, you know, all, all those matters. So he explains what transpired, right? Now, it is, the ball is in Felix's court. He needs to make a decision whether the, the Jews who have come along with Ananias are correct or Paul is correct. Okay. What decision is Felix going to make? Now, let's observe what kind of a personality this man Felix has. Okay. Uh, now, he might have understood that the matters that the Jews are worried about are matters regarding, basically, there's a dispute regarding keeping of the law. Okay. But it's not like Paul is some criminal who has hurt people or caused harm. It, it's not like that. If it was like that, it's clear cut. But this particular issue is re regarding keeping of the law, right? So uh, Felix can take a call and he can say, look, I don't find anything wrong in this. Uh, let's let him go. He could have said that. Or he could have said, um, all right, you know, Paul, you make truce with the Jews and uh, explain yourself to them, apologize, set it right. Oh, okay, matter closed. But you will find that Felix doesn't take a call. Okay. Now, is that part of his personality or what is it? It's kind of strange. But he sits on the matter. So, which becomes very, very, um, you know, like frustrating for everyone involved, especially Paul. So from verse 22, we notice that, uh, you know, Felix doesn't do anything. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. Okay. So what is he doing? It's very unfortunate, you know, sometimes these things happen even in our circles today where no decision is the de decision and, you know, time is just passing by. And now another excuse, Felix just says, okay, to make a decision, how about we wait for the commander to come? Whenever the commander comes, let's take a call on this matter. So at, with that, he stopped it. And uh, so he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. So there's a little bit of freedom that Paul is enjoying, but at the same time, no conclusion. Then uh, again, after some days, Felix comes. This time he brings his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. So maybe there was a little bit of interest from Felix's side 
um, where uh, he wants to know what is Paul all about? What is this whole Jewish tradition all about? So there is that curiosity also. So does he simply want to learn more about Paul's beliefs while Paul is in his custody? Uh, maybe, maybe that, that was his intention. Uh, but overall, he is not providing clarity to this matter. So he brings his wife, Drusilla, who's Jewish, um, and uh, he calls Paul. And, you know, what would Paul do? Every given opportunity, knowing uh, Paul, he will preach the gospel. So when Drusilla comes, um, you know, he has this opportunity to go ahead and preach Christ. So Paul preached Christ to Felix and Drusilla as well. Uh, and uh, he spoke to both of them regarding righteousness, self-control, and judgment, right? And uh, he clarifies what this whole gospel is all about. Now, again, when you look at the response of Felix, it's kind of funny. For Paul's case, he didn't provide any conclusion. Now, after hearing, after hearing, uh, uh, what do you call? After hearing the gospel, at least for that, we would we would uh, hope that you know he would give his life to Christ or he would deny it or something, some clear decision he would make. Same indecision. He doesn't really make a decision. Now we've got to understand a little bit of uh, the bad background, okay? Of uh, Felix and his wife Drusilla. Uh, it is said that this woman was the sister of Herod Agrippa II, and uh, uh, Bernice mentioned in chapter twenty-five. This person, Bernice, will also be men mentioned. Um, uh, you know, they, she, once again, he was, she was the sister of uh, King Agrippa II and Bernice, who will be, who will be talked about later in chapter 25. But what we have to notice is this man, Felix, what he had done is he had actually uh, seduced this particular lady, Drusilla, away from her husband and made her his wife. So there is a moral, um, you know, like a moral issue as far as uh, his relationship with Drusilla is concerned. So we can also understand here that when Paul preached the gospel and when Luke writes it, he's actually saying that Paul preached the gospel, but he talked regarding the matter of righteousness, self-control, judgment to come. Now, come on, you tell me, you know, would these things have uh, created fear in uh, Felix? Of course, because he was at the wrong. This woman, Drusilla, is actually not married in the right way to him. Okay, She's somebody else's wife, but he has taken her. Uh, and when Paul is talking about God and about Jesus Christ and all that, um, he would have been in, in, a, in a place of guilt, like he would have recognized his mistakes. Okay. Now, it's always wonderful when our sense of guilt and shame actually leads us to God and we give our lives to God. But unfortunately, this man, Felix, he seems to be you know such a per i mean he's like sitting on the fence for everything here he doesn't make a decision okay what he does is look at this verse 25 how sad he says to paul go away now when i have a convenient time i will call for you okay so this is not at all a nice response as far as the gospel is concerned see Christ died for us. Our sins are forgiven. So uh, whenever we read about salvation, we read, like even in the book of Hebrews, today is the day of salvation. Okay? So salvation and the gospel is for right now. But when people treat it lightly, casually, uh, and say, I mean, how could he say, 
okay you come back later at a convenient time when is this convenient time you know who knows about uh, 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 like you know human life whether people will be around or not not be around the next moment we don't know but when people take the gospel casually um it's very unfortunate and felix is doing that about the gospel he tells paul you go now at a convenient time i will call for you right we'll again listen to what you have to say and he just dismisses him but luke clarifies later on you know maybe there was one other intention that felix had to brag the case what was that he was expecting paul to give him money to settle the case because actually there was nothing wrong from paul's side and if paul were to give him money felix would have thought when paul gives me money let's close the case so he's not saying it but it's like an unsaid expectation like come on paul fast like give me the money we'll settle the case right that's what he had in his heart he was hoping for that but it never happened can you believe it you know paul was sitting there in the prison for 2 years okay and uh, what happened is what happens in some of the government scenarios the governor changed so till felix left paul was sitting there so the next person who comes in is festus so let's take a break now and we'll go on to uh, uh, chapter 25 after the break thank you